Hey Jesse, how's it going? Ah, it's going well. Okay, so I'm just getting the mat set up. We're gonna do your gait analysis today. So, and measure basically all your foot function, leg length analysis, stride uh, mechanics um, for the purpose of helping prevent that knee issue um, and stabilizing your pelvis. So we're gonna get ready. We're gonna walk in with this mat. I'm gonna teach you how to do that. And then afterwards we'll go through all the results and then we'll talk about the different kinds of orthotics and uh, how to wear them, how to work them in, um, the checkups and all the things we're gonna be looking for uh, as we get used to them. Um, we're gonna teach you how to walk in here. So take your shoes off, socks okay. off and shoes socks off. Okay. Let me just do, I'll do this thing. So that, so the idea here is it's, it's four steps. Okay. You're always gonna start with the foot closest to the table. Okay. And you take one step before you step on the mat. Okay. So it's right, left, right, left, and then okay. pivot off that four step and stop, feet together, and then you'll start again. So one, two, three, four, two, three, four. Good. Right, left, right, left again. So, yeah. Good. Okay. It's happy, so that means there's three consistent steps on each side. And then it'll give us our, our uh, report. So... Um, more or less, this is a dynamic footprint. So okay. in the old days, I mean, we're still used, but casts, which is a mold of your foot. The issue with casts are they're very dependent on how well the mold was done. So there's a lot of human error. Okay. So if the patient moves a little bit, or we don't set your foot up in perfect neutral talus, or we don't watch it, you can get a cast that's not always correct. Most companies have moved to this technology where it's, it's a gate scan, so it's a 3D pressure and then it can measure the dynamic movement of your foot, which is more important than a static position anyways. Um, what we're looking for, we, we do want to see the, like a full footprint like this. Okay. Ideally, we don't usually, we don't want to see that break. What that usually means is that your foot is collapsing. Either some people who have very high arches and won't show up and other people, it means their arch is falling inward or over pronating. Okay. So they won't, uh, we won't have a connection through here. Um, we're also, we don't want to see a lot of red right behind the, the big toe, which is the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. We'd, we want to see the red more like this one where it's between the second, third and fourth. Okay. This is also a little bit elevated under the fifth metatarsal. Another thing we don't want to see is too much red on the inside heel versus the outside. Most people walk slightly toe out. When we hit the ground, we generally hit a little harder with the outside heel than the inside heel. And that's normal. And then the weight usually will travel through the outside of the foot. As the foot lands, it will then move slowly across to the big toe, the second toe, and then through the big toe, or the second metatarsal, and then through the big toe. And that's called the gate line or center of pressure line. And that is what this line is. Okay. So that is your, the ideal center pressure line. Nobody's perfect, but if we're trying to strive for the most efficient foot for you, that's what it would look like. And then the center pressure line that you actually did is this one. Okay. So there's a lot of movement towards the inside off the heel, but then it shifts and overcorrects and it goes too far lateral in your toes and your in the ball of your foot, and then it corrects itself on the right foot. On the left foot, um, it's okay off the heel, but eventually throughout the whole arch, you're collapsing okay. and then it corrects itself for push off. So what we're concerned most about is making sure we correct you through your arch on this one, it's gonna be both through the heel, but through the heel and the arch. So this kind of gives a graphic way of understanding what the orthotic's going to try to allow us to put you in the most efficient position, but also to realign your ankle, realign your shins, realign your knees, which will also realign your hips, all from the ground up. There's eight key points. And these eight points are bony prominences. So there's the two tubercles on the heel, the five metatarsal bones, and the big toe. They're all bony prominences, so they're accurately measured by the mat. The mat scans your foot 60 times per second, so it gets a lot of information. And we can understand timing, pressure, how long the pressure is there, or how lack of pressure, where the pressure is. And then they, they have algorithms that they can compare these to normal ranges. Okay. And we can also compare them to normal ranges for you. So the first thing we'll do is just kind of go through your dynamic footprint. So this is your weight building on your heel. Um, so your, this is heel strike on your left foot. We'll notice that the red is closer to the inside at the, initially. And so we back it up a bit. The red is a little more to the inside than we want to see. We want to see it slightly more to the outside. As your weight, and then your forefoot now lands. So there's your weight building on the outside of your foot. 
the weight shifts over towards the middle between the second, third, and fourth, which is what we want to see. Now your heel is starting to lift. What happens here is when the forefoot lands, we'll see a bit of pronation, which is normal, like up to five degrees. Okay. If it starts to go beyond that, we call that over pronation. That's when people's arches are collapsing, um, which we can measure in a different screen. We can see how much of that's happening. There's your heel lifting off, and now we're pushing off into the next step. And let's do that again. So this just gives us more of a qualitative image of what's happening versus quantitative. And we're not seeing a whole lot of red under that first metatarsophalangeal joint, which is great. And then there's your push off into the next step. So not as bad on this one, but we did notice when you were standing that your arches were collapsing more on your right side. Okay. It was obvious there was a difference from right to left. There's also a difference in your pelvis. This one we can see already that there's a lot of red underneath your first metatarsophalangeal joint. We don't want to see that. That should be all more distributed equally amongst all of the other metatarsals. So we know right away there's already an issue here. We could see it when you were standing when we did what's called an Anderson's test, but this measures it and quantifies it for the lab so they can make the orthotic. So we're going to go through this one slowly and you can see what's happening on your right foot. So your heel strike is okay. The weight's mostly on the outside. Eventually it comes into both of them. As your forefoot now lands, the weight's sort of building through into the lateral foot. And then eventually it's going to transition across. So as your weight starts to come across, now the pronation occurs. If it goes too far, it's over pronation. And that's when we're gonna see, that's exactly what happened right there. So you have a very quick transition across into the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. And it's a little more than we should see. There's not a nice even distribution of the pressure. Okay. So too much pressure uh, falling across too quickly onto your first metatarsal. And that's why you also we're seeing your shin turn in and, um, and that, that angle, that what we call the Q angle being excessive is because your foot's falling inward. And then of course your shin and your knee will follow it. And there's your push off into the next step. So that's, that kind of gives us a bit of a quantitative idea of what's happening, what your dynamic footprint looks like. Then we can go in and look at a little more detail. So all of those points are color coded. There's the middle heel, the lateral heel, the medial heel, the lateral heel, the big toe, which is the hallux, the fifth, fourth, third, second, and first metatarsal going from the outside to the in. The this is heel strike to toe off. And then this is the amount of pressure, overall pressure, that each one of those points puts into the ground. The first thing to hit the ground is your heel, the medial heel and lateral heel. So we can see what they're doing. And then the next is all of the forefoot metatarsals. And the last one should be the big toe, which is also the last one to leave the ground. Now, this is a bit confusing. So what we can do is break this down into the individual, uh, one, each one of those eight prominences. This is the normal range. Nobody's gonna be perfectly rounded like this, but it gives us a, a a range that we should be within in general. In your case, your inside heel on your left foot is putting about 20, 40, up to 50% more pressure into the mat than the ideal range would be. Anything in the bold is outside of the normal range. So your contact, or the amount of time that your, that your medial tubercle is on the ground is 66%. Is, uh, Ideally, it'd be between 49 and 65 the time when it lifts off is at 66% into your cycle. Ideally, that'd be between 51 and 65. The peak pressure is 90%. Ideally, we want to see it between uh, 35 and 45%. And the That's time of peak, yeah, that one's way off. Your pressure is quite high. And then your peak pressure time, so when it occurs, it should be 39% into your cycle, or is at 39% in. And it should be at 20 to 24%, so it should be sooner. And that's why this delay here. So people whose feet are becoming overly flexible, it delays the amount of time that sometimes the heel or the forefoot is on the ground, which is less efficient because now you're absorbing all of your body weight instead of propulsing yourself forward. So it's an inefficient transfer of force through the foot. Orthotics can provide a little bit of rigidity or semi-rigidity back to the foot to make it more what, it's, what it should be in its perfect form and give us a little bit more rigidity, tr better transfer of force, but more importantly, better alignment of all the bones in the foot, ankle, knees, hips, and even the back. Um, so definitely in your case, that left heel is uh, compressing 
uh, the ground too much. But of course, if we if the inside heel is dropping in, we know then that your your arch is also going to fall in, which means your knee may also drop inward as well. Um, this is the outside heel. The outside heel is about 10% uh, higher than it should be. Not too bad. A little bit delayed, and that's just because your foot's become very flexible over the years. And some people, that's genetic as well. Um, your big toe. So it's doing about twice as much work as it needs to when you get into the push-off phase. So the big toe has to kind of make that last push, but yeah. it also helps keep your arch high and your ankle aligned. Um, if it's working too soon and the further back, that's also an issue sometimes where it starts working further in the cycle okay. than it should. In your case, it's kind of starting late in the cycle, but it's making uh, it's making quite the burst of force just to just to get your foot back into alignment for your next step. Um, the big this is the fifth metatarsal, so that's the pinky side, the knuckle on the pinky side, uh, a little bit too high as well. Um, part of that is when your arch is falling in at your heel, it creates a torque or twist in your midfoot that often puts more pressure on the outside of the foot. And that's the fifth, fourth is getting a little better, third's getting a little better, second is close to normal, and then the one that we're the most concerned about is when you rolled over was too much pressure on the knuckle behind your big toe, the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So how many people do you see that are like normal, like relatively normal? Well, not, be, you know, because of pavement, concrete, you know, we live in a world where everything's harder than it was intended to be. So you, we see more of this than we should be, um, because everybody's uh, ligaments and capsules and fascia are stretching out more than they would have had we, if we were all on grass or dirt, still. Yeah. So it's actually, you know, I would say maybe thirty percent of the time that we actually see normal. Okay. And that it might even be less than that. It's very common now. And again, we don't usually scan people unless we already see that they have an issue. So most of the time we're scanning, we've already, we can already see that they're overpronating. So this is more of a measurement tool. So most of the time people are abnormal, but we know that before we scan. Um, we need this just to make the measurements to make the orthotic. So um, if we, I'm sure if we scanned everybody, no matter, regardless of whether we saw it, that we, maybe there'd be a higher percentage of people that, that aren't overpronating. Yeah. But I think uh, what we see nowadays is um, as people get older, their arches start to collapse because of time and what's called viscoelastic creep, which is stretching of the connective tissues. Pretty mm -hmm. normal gravity, all the years of gravity plus hard surfaces and bad footwear or footwear that actually promotes us to overpronate. Um, so that's your, that was all your left side, your right side, um, will be slightly different in your case because in fact your right side is going to be worse in your case because we know you collapse. So in your heel you're 20, 40, 60, 80 percent higher than you should be and it's even more delayed. That foot's even more flexible than your left. Both feet over pronate but just much more on the right. More of a delay and your heel is actually you're striking the ground harder with your right heel than your left. So your big toe same thing here but it's not being recruited to a lot later that happens when people's feet are too clap, too flexible and collapse too much. The big toe can't even be engaged or activated until late in the push-off phase. And then it has to work a lot harder to get to do what it needs to do at the very end of the phase. And that's usually what this indicates. Okay. Um, with the orthotic in and your arch being more supported, this will come back to more normal and the muscles will work the way they're intended. The pressure will be engaged earlier and it won't need to be as much force, which saves burnout and wear and tear and fatigue of the muscles in the foot, it's most, especially the muscles that flex the big toe. So here's your fifth metatarsal, uh, very high as well on that side, um, and also stretched uh, longer than it should be. Fourth metatarsal, third, yeah, second, and first. This foot's got a lot of different abnormalities because you had a very fast transfer from lateral to medial, quicker than it should have been. Um, and that has to do with the fact that that foot is very flexible. It's getting a lot of twist in it. So we're going we're gonna to make it a little more rigid. We're going to get rid of all that twisting. And we're going to create a nice flow of energy through that foot, which is going to save a lot of issues on that right knee and hip okay. and foot. Um, so that's that. Now it also measures a 3D image. Um, so this is sort of that the equal and opposite. This is what the ground is experiencing, which is always equal and opposite to what your body's putting into the ground. So there's your left heel strike your weights transferring through, or right foot in this case. And then there's your outside right foot 
metatarsal to fifth metatarsal, your heel eventually lifts, and then you push off into the next step. Oh, that's cool. The weight switches over, and then there's your big toe getting it ready to push off for your last push. Further evaluation will help us determine that. We can build, if there is a bit of a short leg, we can build a heel lift right into your orthotic, and then the, that'll correct that in addition to correcting the collapsing and the arches, the overpronation. Orthotics, with different types of orthotics. Um, generally with, with sports, we like to put in orthotics that are like, like ones like this. So perforated top cover grips even when it's wet. It's semi-flexible, so it's not, it's not too hard, but it's not too soft. So it doesn't create atrophy in the muscles in your feet because you, your foot muscles still have to be engaged and they still have to work. Older style rigid orthotics that people used to get were, it was like having a cast. It was so stiff and rigid that your foot didn't flex when you walked anymore. So we lost position sense or proprioception, balance coordination, but you also lost muscle because the muscles didn't have to work or couldn't work anymore. So a new orthotics, semi-rigid orthotics nowadays, which most chiros and physios use, will um, have a little bit of flexibility in them. So they, they have some give. They have an arch fill to make sure that they never totally collapse. Even if they wear out after a couple years, you're still always gonna have that arch fill to give you some support until you get your new orthotics. This one has a heel lift for someone who had a shorter leg. So we can add that in and has a grip to make sure it doesn't slide inside the shoes um, and cushioning. Um, so it provides cushioning, breathes, provides the arch support. If we need to support the heel, we can make a wedge shape under the heel if we need to lift one side of your heel up versus the other. Um, so orthotics allow us to correct, custom orthotics allow us to correct biomechanical faults where they're occurring, not afterwards or before. You want to correct it where they're occurring. Non-custom, generally you're just getting a mostly just an arch support and that's it. So if you've got forefoot issues, you've got rear foot issues, that's not gonna be corrected by an orthotic that you would buy off the shelf somewhere. So custom allows us to correct things in a more biomechanically optimal way. So this is the type I recommend for you. We make them a little narrower for your cleats. They also come in smaller ones that are metatarsal length. Uh, metatarsal length orthotics are essentially um, take off all the top covers. They're only this long. So, okay. and they don't have all this top cover material. So it makes them a lot thinner. They're only as thick as the white material. And uh, we can, so that they're very thin orthotics that can be worn in dress shoes or shoes that don't have liners that you can remove. Okay. Most shoes that you have liners you can remove, you can fit these in. And, uh, but you can still put the ones without the liners into running shoes underneath the insole, the, uh, the insole that comes with the shoe. And you can still wear them under those and, and swap them out between different shoes. So for people who wear a lot of different shoes or shoes that don't have liners, we go with the metatarsal length thinner ones. For people who mostly wear shoes that have liners that can come out, we would go more with the full length sport orthotic. There are different top covers. Um, there's top covers that have silver in them so they kill bacteria. There's top covers um, um, that have more absorption or more cushion in them or titanium to be warmer. There's also leather ones for people who work in work boots and they need something that's gonna last longer. These, however, last people mo way more than two years. I've seen them, most people last up to four years, those top covers. Wow. There's right. heel cushions, there's carbon bottoms. If we want something very, very light, that's carbon, it's less thickness. Um, it's got a heel cup to cup the heel. There's all kinds of options depending on what you, each individual person's foot needs. Okay. We usually want you to wear them for four weeks. There's instructions on how to wear them. Usually one hour the first day, two hours the second day, three hours the third, slowly building up until you're wearing them eight, nine hours a day, and then you can wear them full time. Um, takes good three, four weeks for the body to adapt to them, and then we do a checkup. Checkups are always free for two years, just to make sure that they're still working. Um, the first checkup is very important for us to make sure that it's actually correcting the problem. We have 90 days to do a free modification. So if it's not correcting you properly, I'm gonna send it back. If it's bothering you and something's not working for you, it's not fitting your shoes, then we're gonna use that modification to fix that and get it right the first time. Once we get it right, they last for years. Usually we recommend every two years. They also offer 45 day money back guarantee. So if you're not happy, get your money back 100%. Um, and checkups are free for two years just to make sure that if anything's changing, you're starting to get some knee pain, you're concerned, might be related to your orthotics, come in, we take a look, make sure whether or not it is orthotic related. If not, we'll figure out what it is, what is causing it. So, um, and that's about it. Okay, so we'll get these ordered off. They take about a week to come in. Once they're in, the girls will give you a call. Come in, pick them up, follow the instructions. Next week, you're seeing Heather. Heather's going to introduce you to Chinese medicine acupuncture 
um, for the purposes of performance. Um, acupuncture can be used for a lot of different things, but there are some amazing performance-based components to it, which she'll be treating you, and then I'll do a follow-up with you once you get your orthotics. Awesome. Sounds good? good. Cool.